everyone back uh, to the sanctuary and everyone back online. It seems like these weeks go so quickly, doesn't it? It just uh, one thing after another. I'm. Uh, I told the congregation here this morning I'm struggling a little bit with my voice, so I, I have a mint in my mouth. So if it seems like I'm rolling things around, it's a reason. Um, probably it's not going to last as long as my sermon, but I know that's not encouraging to you. But <laughs> we'll see. But uh, but thank you for being back, and uh, thank you for uh, visiting our website. Uh, the um, the website address will show up on the on the screen ogfmc.com and uh, you can find a lot of really good material there and uh, a lot of a lot of information that you can go through and um, with with various various different things that you can check out there all of the sermon videos are there um, you can uh, if you say well I've missed one of these these sermons and I'd like to go back. I hear you're, you know, this is sermon number three of such and such, and I missed the first two. And I just recently signed up online to, to be part of the online congregation. Well, ogfmc.com, uh, all of the sermons are listed there. Just go back, and you can find all of those videos listed right there. I do want to say thank you again uh, for your faithful financial support. Without your help, there's no way. Uh, that we can keep the lights on in here. We don't have a, a large building, uh, but we still have bills that we have to pay, so every bit helps, and I thank you. Now, I want to ask you about your time. I mean, your time is an investment. You you come to a worship service on, on Sunday morning. You, you watch the videos. Uh, for those of you that work on Sunday morning and, or Sunday afternoon, you kind of can watch that video at any given time. But that being said, every one of us are really managed by a bit of a clock. Over the last three weeks, we looked at having a cadence in our life, and we talked about our biological clocks and things like that. This, at this point, we're going to be taking a look at redeeming our time redeeming our time so this week and the next four weeks we're going to be looking at this we are commanded throughout scripture to redeem our time because it says the days are evil it doesn't necessarily mean that your days are evil but if we are to redeem our time we also have to understand that there could be those things that we could get involved in that's not the best way of investing our time because the days are evil and we're running out of time to do the will of the Lord we need to change our focus if our aim is to redeem our time it's imperative that we start with God's Word that is always a you know, that's a training manual do you know that God's Word is the owner's manual for our life anytime you bought a car or a truck a tractor whatever did you ever take and look through the owner's manual and say you know I wonder what this button does and you'll find that little explanation in there somewhere so sometimes our lives need to go back all of the time our lives need to go back to the owner's manual that God has given us about life and about what we are doing so we're going to be taking a look at five different things that scripture says about redeeming our time and what our role is in those five things. I'd like to start off our time with just a brief prayer. Father, we know the days are evil and fleeting. We ask that you give us the fortitude and wisdom to steward our time well so that we can best serve your kingdom. Constantly renew our minds with the promise that we have peace first as your child. And everything we do thereafter is in response to your love and our commitment to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what does it mean to redeem your time? How many of you are coupon cutters? Oh, wow, whole one. 
You get a coupon and you, or depending on where you're from, it's either a coupon or a coupon. How many of you think that it's a coupon? It, and how many of you think it's a coupon? <laughs> well, there's your assignment this afternoon. Go home and check the spelling. Some of you are going to be disappointed. But when we hear that we are redeeming our time, what does it even mean? Does God really care how we spend the time of our days? We have to look at Scripture to find out what He says. The term redeeming your time comes from the book of Ephesians. And after expounding upon the gospel of grace in Ephesians chapter 1 through 4, and we're not going to read all of that, obviously, the Apostle Paul reminds us of our status as dearly loved children of God. And we find that in the fifth chapter of Ephesians. So what is our response to our adoption as sons and daughters of God? Paul answers that question in Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. You see it there? And it says this. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. That's a big challenge, isn't it? We are being called upon to understand what it is that the Lord wants us to do. What if we don't know? What if we're perplexed? We're confused about that. How do we handle that? Well, if you don't understand something, don't you usually ask more questions? And if you're not certain what God is asking of you, then the logical thing to do would be to ask God some more questions, right? There is an interesting Greek word you haven't had a Greek lesson in a while. It's called exagorazo, which means redeeming. And it literally means to buy up or ransom. That's what it means. Have you ever had the thought in your mind, boy, if I could just buy more time? Or maybe you just said, I really wish that I had more time. But as Christians, we are called to buy up as much time as we can. Now before your mind starts fleeting out there and saying, oh, well, I want to buy up some more years. That's what I want to buy. I want to buy some more years. Well, we're not just talking about longevity here. We're talking about stewardship of what we have. So, if we are called to buy up as much time as we can, why? Not so that we will have more time to spend on selfish pursuits. We're called to redeem our time because the days are evil, and we are running out of time to do the will of God. Changes the perspective, doesn't it? We're running out of time to do the will of God. Now, you can look at that a couple of different ways. You can say, well... I'm running out of time to do the will of God because up till now I haven't been doing it and I really need to get on track here before I find that my life is over. Or you say, you know, God's giving me so much to do and he's using my life in so many different ways. I need to make sure that I'm making the best of my days to get as much done for God as I can, I'm running out of time to do more things for God. Whole different way of looking at our life, isn't it? So how do we redeem our time? Over the next five weeks, we're going to look at how the author of time, God, managed his time when he came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. No better example to learn from than Jesus. 
As you read the Gospels, you can't help but realize that Jesus was the most productive person who ever lived. We're going to look at his life and how he managed his time and how we can apply those principles to our own lives today. He is our example. Because he succeeded, he makes a way that we can succeed. You understand that, right? Jesus came not just to give us an example, but to demonstrate and empower us to live a life that is patterned after his. So I want us to take a look at Luke 8, 22 and 23 to illustrate how Jesus is the ultimate solution of our time management problems. Look at that passage there. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and started out. As they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. But soon a fierce storm came, out, came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water and they were in real danger. Wow. So the disciples were out on a lake enjoying a quiet sail with Jesus when suddenly things spiraled out of control. They were no longer in control of the situation. Can you imagine the boat taking on water from every side while the disciples frantically tried to shovel water out of the boat only to look back and see more water than before let me ask you a question does that ever sound like some of your days <laughs> I mean really doesn't that sound like some of our days we we get up in the morning and we have this list of stuff that we've got to get done that's our to-do list for the day. And we don't even get the first two things out of the way before three or four more things pop up. Or you may have had something you had to do before you could even start on your list. So things are, are getting out of, out of hand here. And it sounds like our never-ending to-do list that our boat is filling up with water. And no matter how hard we try, we can't seem to bail out as fast as the water's coming in. Luke says the boat was filling with water, leaving the disciples with only one thing to do. All they could do is bail, but recognizing that they could not calm the chaos on their own, the disciples woke Jesus up and begged him to help. Wouldn't you have loved to have been part of that conversation? I love reading into stories in the Word of God. I really do, because there's so much that we don't have but if I put myself in that boat, I'm not calling myself a disciple, we'll just call me a passenger. Okay, I'm in the boat, I see what's going on. Boat's filling with water, Jesus is at the back of the boat, he's exhausted. He's been preaching, he's been teaching, you know, he's been running around with this ragtag bunch of disciples that always seem to give him headaches on the, all on their own. Not to mention the people that he ran into that, that constantly wanted to abuse him and take advantage of him and even kill him. But I'm looking in the back of the boat and there's Jesus sound asleep and they're saying, you know, we're going to have to wake him up. And say, oh, he's the son of God. You don't wake him up. We don't want him to be angry. We got enough problems as it is. We, we don't want to upset him by waking him up to deal with a problem that we're kind of dealing with here. I mean, we're not sinking. We're just filling up with water. We just need to bail faster. So in verse 24, which is not listed there, shares what Jesus did next. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters, and the storm subsided, and all became calm. He didn't rebuke the disciples. He just woke up and said, hmm, peace, be still. Here's the point. Jesus offers you peace before you do anything. 
Jesus offers you peace while you're still trying to bail out the boat. Which brings me to another point that maybe you've never thought of. The boat is filling with water, right? Jesus calms the storm. Maybe he had a little bit of an object lesson with his disciples. What do you suppose the disciples still needed to do? They still had water in the boat, right? But Jesus took care of the storm and it became a partnership between Jesus Christ and the disciples. It became a deliverance and an opportunity for service all at the same time and they were all in the same boat. This is a bit radical, don't you think? Our culture constantly throws a work-based productivity at us every single day, which claims that if you do X, Y, and Z, you're going to find peace. You're going to find contentment. But that's really contrary to what the Scripture tells us, which is covered with grace-based productivity. That which says through Jesus Christ, we can already have peace in the midst of the turmoil. And we do time management exercises X, Y, and Z as a response to that time of worship. When was the last time you looked at your calendar and everything that was on that calendar that needed to get done and you looked at those appointments and you said actively in your mind and in your heart you're saying look at all of the opportunities that I have for worship today I never looked at it like that and I'd venture to say you probably never have either we do not tend to look at problems and schedules as an opportunity for ministry witness let alone worship again the disciples in the swamp boat they didn't do anything to calm the storm they merely trusted Jesus to still the storm and I really wonder, did they think he was going to stop, calm the storm when they woke him up? Or it was just another person to help bail? Did they really expect Jesus to do what he did? And you and I do the same thing. You see, by trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, we have peace with God. That is secure regardless of how productive we are or how well, how well we steward our time. Forgiveness of sin is forgiveness of sin. That's a life transforming event that changes our whole outlook on life. In the words of author Matt Perman, for Christian, peace comes first, not second. Peace comes first, not second. Jesus spoke peace to the storm before the storm stilled. The mistake that we often make is to make peace of mind the result of things that we do. <laughs> right? Goodness knows we can take care of this problem. So if something's out of line and out of whack, it's my fault. And if I just work harder at it, it'll fix itself. This problem isn't too big or isn't big enough to give to God. Well, if it's not big enough to give to God, then it's too small for you to be worrying about. Time management tactics will never be your most foundational source of peace. And as Christians, our ultimate source of peace, our ultimate solution to being swamped is found in this God-man, Jesus, who calmed the storm. As the Apostle Paul said, Jesus himself is our peace. So now that we've established our place in God's family, we still want to be better stewards of our time, right? Are we, are we in agreement on that all the way around? So here's the question for today. 
what does scripture have to say about time and our role in it? So here's the five things. See, we've been covering the intro up till this point. Truth number one, our longing for timelessness is good and it is God-given. We don't just long to live forever. We also long to be productive forever, right or wrong. It's not just how old you are. Do you struggle more with your age? Now listen to me. Do you struggle more with your age or your ability? It's your ability, isn't it? That's where we struggle. And we find that in anybody's life, no matter how old they are. Young children that go to an amusement park and they want to ride the ride and they've got that little little goomer of a man standing there with his hand held out that says, if you're not this tall, you can't ride. And the little gal, the little guy goes over and he stands underneath there and that hand is four inches above their head and they say, I'm sorry, young lady, I'm sorry, young man, but you can't ride, you're not big enough. So you're saying, oh, if I was just a little older, I could ride. <laughs> Sin has made work and our efforts to be productive difficult in a lot of different ways. But something in our souls and God's word shows us that work was meant to be good. <laughs> Bear with me here because I see the wheels turning already. You know, I've had some really bad jobs and I never once thought that it was good work and did I ever once think that it was an act of worship because it was really not a good job. But, do you realize that in the Garden of Eden, the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. That was before sin came into the picture. We tend to think that Adam and Eve would have just been able to sit there on their on their, what do they call those those high back chairs, the Klondike Zodiacs, what Adirondacks? That's it, Adirondack chair. I knew it was something Canadian. <laughs> Forgive me, Canadians. We just think that Adam and Eve could sit there in the garden and everything just took care of itself. It says no. He, God, put Adam and Eve into the garden to work it and to care for it. The Hebrew word for work here is the word avodah, which is also translated to mean worship. Worship. Work existed pre-sin. Work was good. Work was more than good. Work was worship. Some Christians believe that this longing for timelessness is rooted in pride, but it's not true. The more we study scripture, the more we are convinced that this desire to live and be productive forever was designed by God. There's nothing wrong to try to be productive for more years. Ecclesiastic 11 says this crystal clear saying that God has set eternity in the human heart. Check out Ecclesiastes, you'll find that there. Something in our God-designed DNA tells us we were made for something more than what is. Do you ever come to a point in your life where you say, you know, there's got to be something better than this. <laughs> this can't be all there is. There's got to be something else. There's got to be something better than this. To be human is to work with time that our minds tells us is finite, but that our souls assure us shouldn't be finite. We recognize we're limited on time, but we work to utilize all the time we have with a perspective of eternity. So why is time finite? Why does that happen? It's the second point. Sin has ensured that we will all die with unfinished business. Well, so much for an encouraging message, right? Not only did I just tell you you're all going to die, but you're all going to die and you're not going to get everything done you want to get done. 
and you're just going to leave everything behind you, what are you going to do now? When sin entered the world, death was ushered in alongside it. Take a look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. It says this, And to the man he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Hmm. We also find passage in Corinthians that says, For since death came through one man, the resurrection of the dead also came through one man. So God gave us hope even at the point of sin in the Garden of Eden. He said there is going to be a remedy for this. And he cursed Satan for the temptation. And he said, one of these days, this woman's seed is going to stomp your head into the ground, Satan. The seed of that woman was Jesus, the Son of God. Human beings who were created to be immortal became mortal. Work which was created to be good became difficult. Time, which was created to be infinite, became finite. Sin has ensured that nobody will ever finish the work that they envision completing in their own lifetime. It's just the way it works. Carl Reiner said it this way, In the torment of the insufficiency of everything attainable, we learn that ultimately in this world there is no finished symphony. One of my favorite movies is Mr. Holland's Opus. If you've never seen that movie, you got to watch it. I won't even give the storyline away. You just need to see it. But when we read this quote of Karl Rahner, it can be depressing, but it's true, isn't it? We'll all die with unfinished symphonies. Our to-do list will never be completed. There will always be a gap between what we can imagine accomplishing in this life and what we really need to get done. Thank goodness sin didn't get the final say. Which brings us to the third point, that God will finish the work that we leave unfinished. God's work will go on whether we're here or not. So God created created us to live forever, but sin broke creation, has broken creation and made us mortal, time-bound and finite. So what's the hope then? Our hope is found in Jesus. He walked out of the tomb that first Easter morning with a redeemed body that could not be destroyed ever again. And the resurrection was Jesus' way of declaring that our longing for immortality has been right all along and that through him we too can experience eternal life. He promised that. That it would be restored. So to simplify the Christian story then, God created us to live and work with Him in a perfect garden. Sin messed it up. God promised a remedy. With the defeat of death on Easter, Jesus proved that He is the promised King and that everything from that moment to the end of Revelation is all about building up the kingdom of God until Jesus returns to finish the job and restore things to what he meant them to be. So what does that really mean for us today in the presence? In the present? The Apostle Paul says, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. He also says we're co-workers in God's service. You ever think of yourself as a co-worker with God? Because God alone will finish that work and ultimately bring heaven to earth, we can embrace an amazing truth today, the fact that God doesn't need you or me to finish our to-do list. If the things on our to-do list are on God's to-do list, He will complete them with or without us. With or without us, God's going to get the job done. 
And that's why point number four is so powerful, that the gospel is our source of rest and ambition. As we've seen, God doesn't need us to be productive, but if we're honest, we often need ourselves to be productive to feel a sense of self-worth. So we hang our own idea of productivity and success, we hang it out there and we say, well, this must be what God is requiring, when really it's our own expectations that get us into trouble. We did nothing to earn God's love. There's nothing that we can do to lose God's love. No matter how productive you are in this life, your status as a child of God remains the same as you remain a child of God by an ongoing, constant surrender of your will to Him. So what is God's agenda? What is it that God wants us to do? What is the ultimate part of our story? What are we trying to get accomplished? Oh, we put a spin on it. We like to think that we know what it is. But have you ever gone back to, to God and said, Lord, this is what I'm seeing, but help me to see it with your eyes, Lord. The phrase good works has often been misinterpreted. We can think it only refers to charity or ministry work, but when we look at the Greek word used, ergon, we see it is translated to mean work, task, and employment. <laughs> you thought you were retired. Nope, you're still working. So it brings us to the last truth. We can know how God would manage his time how God would manage his time. When the author of time became flesh, meaning Jesus, he became fully human, meaning that he experienced the same day-to-day -day challenges other mortals faced. As a matter of fact, we're told that he is in always tempted like we are, yet he's without sin. But do you ever have to take a step back and to realize some things that maybe you haven't thought of before, the fact that Jesus had a business to run? What? Jesus, you're saying Jesus' ministry was a business? No. Think about it for a moment. He had a business to run, a mother and father to care for, hunger to manage, the need for sleep, he was raised a carpenter's son. Obviously, he worked with Joseph. He was trying to make ends meet as well. And by the way, he faced the same 24-hour time constraint as every other human being. Isn't it funny that when we have the time change, we say, oh, I get my hour back. Like all of a sudden, we have 25 hours in a day. There is an old Indian saying that says only a white man, only a white man thinks that by cutting one inch off of the one end of the blanket and sewing it to the other end of the blanket that he gets a longer blanket. <laughs> Nothing changes, you see. Jesus was challenged to steward his time on earth much like we are. And he tells us, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. That's what Jesus said. He said, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. He said that in a prayer to God his Father. But how in the world could first century Jerusalem compare to what we deal with today? Well, hmm. I'm going to give you some shocking news here that you probably have never thought of. Jesus didn't have email. <laughs> he didn't have a smartphone. We could argue that he had a secretary to kind of, you know, with the other guys that are around him to kind of help him keep moving and, and going on. We know that the group traveled with with men and women alike, and I'm certain that there was probably one woman in the group that tried to tell him what to do. Which, I need to tell you, would be a very good thing. 
Did I say that okay? I'm wet. I did. We'll see. <laughs> we can say that Jesus didn't have the distractions that we have now. Surely it was easier for Jesus to manage his time, right? But we see time and time again that Jesus was constantly interrupted. He was constantly having to make choices about his priorities and to say no to people. And time and time again, it says that he went off by himself to pray. He needed a break. As Hebrew 14, 15 reminds us, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. You see, in the person of Jesus, the word became flesh, ensuring that he would empathize with all of our weaknesses, including our efforts to redeem our time. So closing things up here. Throughout the rest of this series, we're going to walk through seven principles that the gospel shows us for how exactly Jesus redeemed his time. Today, I'm going to leave you with the first, and I believe the most important step to redeeming our time, starting with the Word of God. Spending time with the Word of God. To redeem our time in the model of our Redeemer, we must first know the author of time his purpose for the world, and what he called us to do with the time that he has given each of us. Jesus frequently broke away, like I said, from the crowds and his disciples to spend time alone with his Father. And for us, this can look something like this. Reading scripture daily, meditating on what you need, and praying throughout your day. You don't have to stop, drop, and fold your hands and pray. almost said stop, drop, and roll. <laughs> To stop, drop, and, and pray. You can pray as you are doing the events of your day. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to take three hours. But carve out some time. Dig into scripture and see what God has to say about our time. And how we are being called upon to spend it. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. For the time that you give each and every one of us. Thank you for your faithfulness to us and teaching us from your word. Lord, everyone that is hearing this message, myself included, can say, I have allowed my idea of what needs to be done get in the way of what you want to get done. So open my eyes and my heart. Open all of our eyes and all of our hearts. Help us to focus in upon you and to redeem the time that you've given each one of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.